Hello, everybody. Woo! So, <laughs> uh, nine minutes late, that's okay. Um, welcome, everybody, to the Lisbon UX meetup here on Wadify. Um, Wadify people, Wadify people, you'll find them around. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about governance, which is a very big word for. <coughs> Uh, the systems that we use to govern ourselves and the rules that we create for ourselves and all that in society, in companies, in our own lives. Uh, and we're, we have three speakers and then we have a, uh, three talks, actually. And then we have a discussion panel. Uh, and it's going to be interesting. So it has a little bit to do with design, but more to do with uh, how we govern ourselves. Uh, in companies, in life, in countries, in nations, and all that. So... Um, I just wanted to keep an open mind throughout the thing. And uh, we're going to be streaming the three uh, talks and not the discussion panel. So we're going to do three talks and a little break. And then we're going to do the discussion <coughs> panel without uh, streaming or recording or nothing like that so that people can talk freely. But the talks will be recorded. So save your questions for the end for the discussion panel where all the speakers will, uh, will be available to ask questions. And the moderator will also be grilling them, hopefully. <laughs> um, so, first off is Pedro and José from Wadify, and they're going to talk a bit about the change that Wadify has um, made in last year. Year? Yeah, year. Uh, and I think it's uh, interesting for you to through for the people that came to the last meetup. We talked about designing organizations and Jose was there and he uh, did uh, showed us some, talked about some examples in, of about Wadify, so we're going to be following through on that with his opening talk. Okay? So that's it. Let's welcome Pedro and Jose. Coming. Uh, I'm Pedro from uh, Wadify. I'm the creative director here. And uh, Jose is going to be here with me. He's a digital product designer here at Wadify uh, as well. We started at Wadify three years ago, approximately. And we started together. <coughs> the first thing that we did was to put ourselves in a plane and go to the States to know our clients, our team, and our company. Wadify is a fitness platform built to empower gym owners, coaches, and athletes. Um, but today, we're not going to talk about technology or design. We're going to talk about the cultural transformation that we've been living, not in last year, but in the last seven months. Um, I want to start with... It's a little bit slow. I, <laughs> I want to start with a question. Yeah, it's a little bit slow. It's a bit slow for the next speakers. I want to ask you, who do you think is this person talking here? Who do you think it is? Any clues? A client. A client? Sorry? A client? A client? Gym owner? A gym owner. <laughs> designer? A designer. Reception. A reception. <coughs> A cooker. So, if you knew Lucy, she's our office manager in the US, uh, you would say, Lucy talking to an audience like this? Absolutely not. Um, Lucy uh, uh, is talking, addressing the whole company in a, in a dinner that we did last year in June in Culture Week. And we really love this picture because this is, the, this is what happens when you create a safe environment. This is what happens when you create a, an environment that uh, is able to make you learn and grow and where it's uh, risk safe. Okay, let's see how it works. 2018 was a really game change, changer for, for What If I Culture. And uh, next we are going to see a quick recap of what happened.
No. Okay. Does it work? Yeah. It's not this, it's a real video. <laughs> it's just a placeholder. <laughs> What if I call her weak? What if I call her weak? But anything is awkward at me. No, 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 no. 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 Yeah, it's the first one. Yeah. That's it. Can you say press play? Press play. Yes. Pause. videos <laughs> it's just this one so uh, last year uh, what if I shut down for an entire week basically the company invested <coughs> half a million dollars uh, to bring the entire team from Portugal to the US and together in one place for the first time in the six year history of our company but the question is why did we shut down in the previous five years, we grew fast, expanded internationally, and even launched new products. But we started to make poor decisions, uh, valued skills over culture, and also had unhappy employees. In the early days, we were known for our rapid innovation, and that was no longer the case. Worst of all, we weren't having fun anymore. <coughs> that was one thing missing, a strong culture. A strong culture is the glue that sticks teams together. It helps clarifying decisions, and a strong, a strong culture helps you keep your best people. And also, it makes them agree with processes and build strong, safe relationships. <laughs> So Culture Week was the first step to start building a stronger culture. <coughs> uh, we had a chance to meet and bond. There were a lot of people that never met personally, that never uh, were introduced or even uh, be at the same place at the same time. 
and um, it was the perfect ideal scenario to create new relationships and to start building these foundations. During this week, we laughed, we literally cried, we drank a lot, we did fun stuff like improv, we did workshops, hi, we did workshops on Japanese, on crochet, I don't know, <laughs> crochet. Uh, we even went to a Phillies game, as you can see, and some of us went to a, to a, a baseball match for the first time. We uh, had this week literally for everyone, and um, developers, designers, uh, customer support, salespeople, onboarding, and our entire uh, executive team was there uh, pre present to build our uh, foundations of our culture. While Culture Week was transformative <coughs> for Wattify, the end of the week was not going to be the end of our efforts uh, on uh, this cultural shift. This week had <coughs> three purposes. First, build personal relationships, personal and live uh, in, the, in, the, in the spot. The second one was to build one shared purpose. And the third one was to build one set of values. Uh, these values will drive all the decision making. That was uh, what we wanted to achieve with these values. After we came back, and when we came to Lisbon, and when the team get back to the office in the US, we felt that something was changed. Um, there was a new feeling around the office. People were optimistic. Um, they were getting to help everybody that uh, was in their way. And we even started to see new leaders emerging. Um, in the weeks following, it took a bit to perfect and to finalize our project. <coughs> and ultimately, we came to, to empower a fulfilled life. It's our purpose here at Qualify. And it's not only for every person that works at Qualify, it's also our community, our, our customers, our partners, our uh, 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 every, everybody that is with us. We also developed 10 set, 10 core values that are listed here. I'm going to just read them out loud. The first one is serve with a caring heart, no matter what, no matter who. The second one is be open, honest, and respectful. Lead like a business owner is number three. Inspire wise thinking, fourth. Five and six is be humble and grow from failure. Do the right thing. Value number seven is invest in yourself and others. Eight, keep calm and collaborate. Nine, be authentic. And ten, stay positive and have fun. And as you can see, they cover all different areas like communication, relationships, um, uh, productivity, uh, performance. But they also are very connected to each other. And for example, we created a deck of cards and we gave them to everybody for them to have like a tool to use in, 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 in their daily lives. We like to share two examples that we saw happening in our team already. The first one is one of our engineers realized that he wasn't investing in himself or others, value number seven. So we took the lead and we started uh, um, coaching new uh, engineers that were coming. Very soon others followed. Another uh, example is we had a product team that identified that one of their newer team members was not embracing culture as we ex uh, expect. And so they started coaching them and ultimately the employee self-selected out. And that's okay, because this is our culture, it's what we define, that it's our values, our purpose, and our truth. And it's for us, might, might not be for everybody. And that's totally okay. When we came back, we continued to weave our <coughs> core values into our uh, operations. Um, after Culture Week, we created something called the Offers. We offered to every employee in Modify the possibility to receive two months of severance if they wanted to quit right away, if this is not for them. Um, the result that we had, we lost 10% of our team. 
that we had a baseline to start building our culture again. And we also wanted to give people the chance to live in a good way and with some cash in their hand, of course, and if it's good. <coughs> we also took a look on, at onboarding, and in the first month <coughs> of onboarding, we offered our new employees, the, the ones that are uh, being hired, uh, one month of uh, salary if they think that during onboarding Modify is not for them. And that's okay as well. We took a look at our recruiting process, for example, and we restructured the way we interview people, the way we hire, the way we won board, and everything now is aligned with our culture. Um, we perform skills interviews and we also perform culture interviews. And the reason that we do this is I can easily teach you one new skill, but I cannot teach you a new value because your personal history already influenced you. So it's by identification and belonging. It's not, I, I'm, I cannot push you to be a part of your culture. We also developed culture curriculum, and this is the funny part. Um, we trained the entire company on values. <coughs> Everybody did a set of training. And this picture that you're looking at is the graduation. And everybody finishes the, the, the culture curriculum. You do the graduation. And everybody doing the graduation must say the oath. And the oath finishes with a burpee. I don't know if you are a crossfitter, athlete or something. A burpee is something really hard to do. It's kind of like a like sound. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Please, come on, do it. In the end, I will show it. So after this graduation and the, the oath and the onboarding, we uh, also recruited internal value ambassadors to make sure that the values are in our mindset for the whole year. So we have 10 Portuguese value ambassadors and 10 uh, uh, American value ambassadors that are promoting values and culture in our office and that are on onboarding new hires. <coughs> and we dedicated one month of the year for each value just to create something, a brand activation, a game, uh, um, an event or something. <coughs> but this is only the beginning and they will start talking about more concrete yep. things. So, the thing is, after building the foundations of our culture, we keep pushing forward. The next step was to look into the future and design strategic guidelines. And we started by uh, being driven by OKRs, defining the company objectives for 2019. After that, all the teams across the company defined their key results to reach these goals. And this allows us today to know the reason why we are doing our work and where we are heading to. Our teams became fully autonomous and more flexible. We created smaller, faster, and multitask teams. And all the product designers were integrated into the product teams. And for those teams, we were given the power to restructure their processes. That led to more collaboration, and new cross-team projects emerged from that. Communication is key. Sometimes we forget simple things. Uh, things like communication, one of our biggest critical pain points. We had to make it more simple and transparent. With that in mind, uh, with that in mind we work on improving the, the communication between teams. We created an internet page, keeping everyone in the loop. And also this internal app effort of improving our communication also extended to our customers. <coughs> We gave power to the people. Teams start owning the different stages of product development. <coughs> values ambassadors uh, became accountable to promote values. And everybody now has an worthy opinion on strategy. Step by step, decision making became faster and also shared. People-centric company, we are now committed to improve everybody's lives. We want to improve the communities where we are integrated, both in uh, Lisbon and, uh, and Philly. And an example of that, last we, year we gave more than 1,000 hours in community service. 
We want to provide the best service to our customers by serve with a caring heart. That's one of our values. And with that, we start moving from a customer success to an account management model. And we also want to make our employees happy. For that, we start planting the seed step by step to create a growth path for everybody in the company. Okay, so I don't want this. <laughs> Zev was just talking about a tiny bit of what happened here in Wallify in the last seven months. Um, we are still going on through this transformation, and these were some crazy seven months full of new stuff, new processes, new ideas. Uh, what we can do, the balance that we can do today is that we definitely have a more autonomous environment to work. Uh, we have a more empowered environment. People have more power to give their opinion, to, to participate. Um, it's safer to fail at Qualify because we know that every time we fail, we're going to learn something new. It's not easy to put this in your mindset, but we are trying our best. Uh, we feel that we have a more proactive environment as well. And ultimately, <laughs> everybody feels much more happier. And the big thing that we want to share with you today here is three things, uh, three giveaways that uh, either in your companies or in your, if, if it's your company or your team, that we want to pass along with all of you today. First, and we cannot stress this enough, is if you wait, it will be too late, for sure. Um, it's not going to be obvious that you have a cultural problem until it's too late. Um, this was true for Wallify, so why, that's why we stopped. And it's true for thousands of other companies uh, that we know and we don't know. Culture is something that is going to erode at a certain point of time, whether it's by growth or by other factors. And uh, when you sit down to try to understand it, you're going, to, you're going to realize that you cannot pinpoint it to a specific time or a specific place. It's a series of events that are going to happen all along. So, for, to avoid this, <laughs> we say take action right now and um, just try to consider your company culture. And the first thing that you can do is start a conversation within your company. We have a purpose, we have values. Uh, what does it, if we do, let's talk about it, let's iterate. If we don't, let's do it, for sure. The key takeaway, the second key takeaway is uh, that everyone needs to be involved. Um, transforming, a, transforming a culture, or working on culture is truly a collaborative process, and it's not something that leadership or management do inside of a conference room with a closed door. It's something that needs to be participated and collaborate and done in collaboration. That's why during Culture Week we invited partners, customers, and everybody that was part of the meeting. Finally, there's no finish line. We have been living this every day for the last seven months with uh, really big conviction that we're doing the right thing, and um, it will never stop. We are sure about that. It's going to be a never lasting project, and it's not something that we just check, it's done, uh, let's move on. Um, try to remember that it's up to each and every person in your company to embody your purpose and to embody your values and make each other accountable for them. Um, what we are trying to do here at Qualify is to hire, fire, promote, and invest in opportunities, but all according our purpose, our values, and our culture. We know that we are going to continue to evolve our culture as long as we keep growing and we keep functioning. So, we know that, oh, it's yours. <laughs> So, we know that uh, all of this, it's not going to be easy. 
it's not being easy for us, it's not uh, easy in the present, it's not going to be easy in the future, it's an ongoing process. And most of all, it takes effort, perseverance, that's a hard word for me to say, <laughs> yeah, okay. and above all, patience, a lot of patience. But if you can build a culture that people love, you will create a lasting competitive advantage. And hopefully, like us, strive to live a really fulfilled life. Thank you all. Thank you for Estava a mostrar um e eu aqui apaguei este. Apaguei este. Put that in your Hello. Next mm -hmm. up is Victor. Let me just introduce you for a bit. Um, hmm. You're hard to introduce because I met you in something completely different, but it's okay. He's going to introduce himself as well. <laughs> <laughs> Victor is going to talk about a very cool topic, which is self-designing things. And uh, when I heard about that on his website primarily, and I've seen some of his social media posting, like, I decided to invite him when I saw a live stream of a Hangouts call that he was doing with his team and they were cooking f uh, soup together. Like they were cooking some soup and you were streaming with your team and they were also cooking the soup and all, everybody was following the same mm. step and all that. Uh, he's an expert on remote working and distributed teams and he's going to talk about what is a self-designed team, uh, especially for the remote um, distributed kind of work, okay? Uh, I'll talk about. Go ahead. Uh, I live in a very different world than the previous gentleman. Uh, we work in a we're a small team of ten people distributed literally around the world, but we definitely strive for creating the similar thing of having a great culture of of fun. We definitely don't have half a million for any of our retreats, but still we managed to get together once a year and it's super important. We've been doing it for three years. And with the cooking reference, so as part of, since we don't have an office, it's important to kind of just chat once in a while. So we have once a week a water cooler call where we just kind of generally talk and like, just talking was boring, so I was like, and I work with engineers, right? And it's all single guys, right? And I hear what they eat and they eat shit. And I was like, maybe I can teach the guys to teach soup, to cook soup, and it'll kind of like, I have a simple, so we tried it, it was kind of fun. Uh, you know, it's like something to do, because in the end, right, what matters is that people have this time to hang out and just chat together about something that's not work. It's really relevant, what we're talking about, it's spending the time together as people. Uh, so, uh, since this is a UX thing, as I was, uh, a UX meetup, as I was thinking about this is, you know, how can we think about our team and our teamwork as a user experience? It's a user experience design problem, right? You know, I mean, we are here, we are having an experience, it's a, you know, we are the users of this team, right? Uh, so, just quickly, who I am, I've been working off and on 20 plus years in various forms of remote work. It's kind of disturbing. And the last two years, what's most relevant, been uh, leading a fully distributed team. We are in Canada, well, I'm here in Eritrea, Poland, Pakistan, Moscow, Armenia, Kazakhstan, the other side of Russia, and Japan. So really around the world. Uh, yeah, I, mean, I was never really happy in big companies. I think I've been freelance for over 15 years now, living in many places. And for 10 years now, I've been really interested in non-hierarchical organizations, just kind of because, well, I don't like hierarchy. I mean, if somebody's smart and they're telling me what to do, it's fine. But if they're just like whoever and they're telling me what to do, well, I don't care. 
Uh, so I was really interesting, like, oh, there's other ways to organize. And I started studying this. And over the past two years I've been doing distributed work, it's really come together, right? Because, you know, people argue companies work, everybody's fine. Like, why should we try different ways of organizing? Well, when it comes to distributed teams where there is no office and everybody's separate, it's different in many subtle ways. And for me, it really clicked. The two really fit well together. So this is something I'd like to talk about today. So maybe to start with, what is a distributed team? Because this kind of remote work and there's many different things, it's newly developing, right? So the way I like to think about it is kind of like three different types of working remotely. There is working from home, like once or twice a week, you don't have to go to the office. I'm not talking about that. I don't know anything about that. Not my world. There is hybrid teams, which means some people are in an office, some people are not in that office. Don't do it. It's horrible. Because the kind of culture that you have in an office is very different from the kind of culture you have in a remote team. If you have this scenario, make it two teams. One which is all distributed, and by distributed team I mean nobody has an office, and another team is in an office, and then they can interface and collaborate as teams, but don't mix people, some who are in office, because the people who are not in office will always be at a disadvantage and everybody will be unhappy. I really don't recommend it and I don't want to work with any, anybody. I do a little bit of consulting, I don't want anybody who does that. So what I uh, focus on distributed teams, so that means there is no office, uh, but actually the way we are spread out I wouldn't recommend because time zones matter. So what I kind of, as a rule of thumb, I recommend four hours working time overlap between everybody, which still gives you like big chunks of the world, right? But don't spread it out more than that because if you have teamwork, people need to be able to easily talk and meet to each other. So don't <coughs> spread it more than that. And really, at least once a year, people should get together. If you have a team that's spread around Europe, that's no excuse, it's cheap enough, you can get together a few times a year. But I think kind of like once a year is a minimum sustenance level to keep the human connection going. And it's really, and it's really wonderful, as you guys discovered. We've had with my team three get-togethers now. And it's like the Japanese who don't really speak English, the Russians who think they don't speak English, but they speak English. And it's like this. And still, despite this like complete you know, like dysfunction and different characters and all of this, still, after each one, everybody says that working together is better. So <coughs> probably whatever scenario you might end up with is going to be more closely culturally aligned and it will be easier. But even if it's not culturally aligned, still spending the time together, eating together, and hanging out in person is useful. Uh, so why would you want to work remotely or on a distributed team? Freedom, because you get to choose your work from different companies around the world. Flexibility, because you know, when the weather is nice and you don't have meetings, you just go outside and surf, go take care of your children or whatever you like to do. And because of that, it can be more fun. Uh, so, wow, 55 minutes? I haven't been speaking for 55 minutes. The clock didn't reset. Uh, so the reasons you wouldn't work want to work in distributed team or remote is that what you actually learn when you work as a freelancer or without an office is the fact that like you have to be at an office at 9 a.m. and on the weekend there is no work gives your life a lot of structure which is actually convenient. You know, if you don't have that, the risk is you end up working all week, especially if you're doing some projects which you love and you burn out. Like for example, I had now I force myself 24 hours a week. I turn off the computer. I don't touch it. I do a digital saba, right? But because over years it just worked so much, and I love everything I do. And you just like do more and more and more and more, and you end up burning out. It's inevitable. So you have to have self-organization. Of course, you have to have responsibility because you know nobody's looking over your shoulder or whatever. You know, if you don't wake up self-motivation. If you don't wake up in the morning, you get out of bed, nobody will notice most of the time, right? And so, yes, this idea that self-discipline is no longer optional. So we really, you know, we take for granted, and it might suck, or oh, if I don't go to the office, my boss is going to yell at me, blah, blah, blah. But this means, you know, you got right there motivation to go to the office. If nobody's going to yell at you, you really have to be getting out of bed and getting to your desk for working because you actually love and really want to do what you're doing. Uh, so, uh, and in terms of collaboration, I really find it's interesting. You might think like, oh, people work at a distance. So, 
it's, you know, it's dehumanizing, it's less human. But I find actually that if you want the team to work properly as a team, you have to take much more care of the human side. Because if people don't like each other a little bit, it's just going to go to shit. If they have like something, I, I work a lot with engineers and there's this kind of culture of toxic communication where people are just kind of like, you know, you know, like people just like to be mean to each other, right? It's just kind of fun, this kind of like, but if you do this remotely and you write a shitty message somewhere on Slack, the person doesn't see that you're laughing or that your body language is whatever, and they're like, oh shit. You know, and they think about it, and it quickly just goes and degenerates. So you really need positive communication. Uh, you know, bad relationships just really can sink a team very quickly. And because everybody has to be self-motivated, if you don't like the work and it's like, oh shit, I'm gonna have to talk to that guy again, you just can't be bothered and you stop working or you find another job. So I actually think distributed teams are more fragile and really need more care in the human in the human angle, right? Because you don't have this, you don't see the person's body language. You don't have that like, oh, you know, he was an asshole and he shouted me at the meeting, but then we went for lunch and it was okay, or we went for drinks and it was okay, you know? That doesn't exist. If they were shitting in the meeting, there was their last interaction with you and, you know, you're gonna be thinking about it until the next meeting and it just doesn't work. So the human side actually, for me, becomes much more important. And, you know, you guys, uh, you're really invested in your culture now, but for a while you went without that investment. In the distributed team, I don't think that would work because just people quit very quickly. So uh, what is the, the kind of great UX for a distributed team? And I actually think that it's great UX for any team, but in an office, you know, we know, uh, if all of you work in great offices, that's great, but I'm sure you know friends that work in offices where the environment isn't wonderful. And, but still, people go to work and these companies go on for years. In a distributed team, it's no longer optional, so things like psychological safety, positive communication, continuously improving how we work together. Uh, and adopting a few rituals like the water cooler or cooking together and things like this, which at the start seem a little bit like weird and awkward, but you just kind of go with it and after a while it becomes natural. So, so yeah, so why, why do I think that you know, these kind of human things are important? And it going back to this, this remote work, you know, if I have freedom and flexibility, then I do what's fun. And if my work isn't fun, then I discover that after three weeks, I actually spend all my time on the PlayStation or swimming or running or with the dog or whatever. And it's like, oops, I wasn't working. And either I get fired or I find another job anyways. So really, the work has to be enjoyable and self-motivating for, for people to, to do the distributed work. And it is possible. These are some quotes of guys that are working on the team that I lead. And last year, we had a really amazing experience. We hired three guys, one guy in Khabarovsk. Just, that was a mistake, because it's even further time zone than Japan. But he's a good developer, so I don't know. Uh, and a guy in Georgia, and a guy in Kazakhstan. And well, first like trial period, you know, da, da, da. And actually turned out that they were sneakily had daytime jobs, which we didn't like. But after two, three months, all of them said, we have a much better atmosphere here in this distributed team than in our office. Screw that. We're quitting our jobs. We want to work full time for you. So it is possible. It's not just me. It's certainly the team leader and other people <laughs> there. It's everybody's, it's everybody's thing. But it is really possible to create a great culture, even though these guys have never met any of us, because they haven't been to a, any of the company get-togethers. So hierarchy. Uh, Certainly, if you have a distributed team, you know, and people work because they are being, because they are being looked over the shoulder or out of fear or something like this, it's not going to work because in a distributed team, nobody's looking over your shoulder. So really, you need to have everybody being self-motivated and, uh, you know, and, and, and self-directed and hierarchy doesn't, uh, doesn't fit with that. So how do we create this uh, teamwork which has really an engaging, an engaging UX, engaging 
uh, UX teamwork, which promotes and enhances people's self-motivation, self-organization, and self-responsibility. So what I believe, and I should look up, I don't have the research, but there is lots of research, and probably a lot of you have felt this yourselves. When somebody gives you responsibility and says, you take care of this, you become engaged, right? Like, wow, it's my responsibility, especially if you are allowed to take the responsibility yourself and say, yes, I will do this. Certainly for me, this is my biggest motivator. Say, yes, I will do this. God damn it, I'm going to do everything in my power to try and do that. Very different from like, you do this, right? When I say I'm going to do this, it's my responsibility and I'm engaged in making that happen in every way I can. And this is the kind of feeling that, uh, that we need. Uh, of course, there is Agile, which is kind of a good first step towards self-organization and self-managing teams, but there's many things which Agile doesn't cover, like you know, how our work hours is decided, vacation times, divisions of responsibilities. So Agile is a really great first step, and it opens the door for many organizations to looking at further into going from hierarchy to something like this. And What's worth remembering and what my big discovery is, people say like, oh, we don't like hierarchy, we'll give up hierarchy, everybody's equal or flat or whatever. And actually that doesn't work because we need organization and different people have different skills and, and all of this. So what instead what we have is a organization which is developed and grown and uh, are organized for the people, for the work that needs to be done, the project, the team. And oftentimes, what this means is that the organization that you end up with is much more complicated than a hierarchy. Hierarchy is really nice because it's simple. It's, we always know who's in charge, right? And the people at the bottom just kind of go say, my boss is an idiot. The people at the top say, my workers are idiots. And, you know, everybody knows what the thing is, right? Here, you know, like you're responsible for the things that you said you'd be responsible for. You don't have anybody more to blame, and you need to know who's responsible for which part. It needs to be documented. It needs to be mapped out. It needs to be discussed. People need to take responsibility. So actually, a self-designing team is much more can be much more complicated than a simple hierarchy. And it's also, for me, it's very interesting. I always like looking at history of things. It's important to remember where hierarchy came from. So about two, three hundred years ago, corporations started. We started industrializing. They looked around. What were, what were the big organizations they could copy organizational systems from? The church and the military. Hierarchy comes from the church and the military. And probably for the military, it works. Church, when you've got God at the top and like this, you know, then OK, it makes sense. But we are creative people. I don't think it's the ideal organization, and I think, especially if you want work to be fun, I think a different, different organizational structures are worthwhile, are worth exploring. So I copied this from this less, uh, less side, this kind of idea of, you know, how do we map out different types of organizations, and what does a self-designing organization mean? So, of course, you know, when you have doing work, it's always the team. Uh, monitoring and managing progress, you know, in a management organization, this is what management does, right? If you have self-managing organization, the team takes care of uh, monitoring itself and managing itself. Uh, similarly for standards. In a self-designing organization, the team has responsibility for all of its organization, culture, and everything. Of course, there's always some sort of an external client, whether it be a client of the company or an internal thing. Somebody, you know, we're trying to create something for somebody. So you can never, you know, there's always some externalities which we need to respond to. But this idea that a self-designing team takes care of not just the work, but also monitoring and managing its progress, its standard, and its culture and processes and the development of those. So this is what uh, this idea of a self-designing team. So what does that mean for managers? I don't know. Some people love being managers. Uh, or, you know, we certainly, we certainly need, we still need leaders. There's always a need for leaders. So it's this idea of the people who are more senior in the company, instead of moving from command control, move to building division 
to being leaders and to coaching people who are doing the work. So this idea of a servant leader, where rather than going around and telling people what to do, you inspire people with division and then go, this is division. What do you need to make it happen? Right? You know, do we need training? Do we need to hire more people? Tell me how I can support you in making this vision come to reality. Uh, it's a kind of a different role. This is why I, see, I understand why a lot of people, like if you spend 20 years working on your career as a command and control manager, becoming a visionary leader and a coach is not going to excite you. So I can see how a lot of people have resistance to that. But on the other hand, if this is the kind of, uh, you know, if you are young and, and, and uh, it, it can be, I think, a much more fulfilling career and a much more fulfilling way of, of working with teams. Uh, so, huh? I have, so the way I see it is the future of work means better teamwork UX. Uh, here are some uh, interesting, maybe they, I'll give you a list and you can mail it out, because these are things which I think is really worth knowing about, just to have an idea. There is a lot of, over the past 10, 15 years, there's been a lot of work and a lot of research in kind of making better workplace UX. The first one I think everybody should know about. Who's heard of Project Aristotle, the good old work on battle teams? One, a few, you, a few people. Everybody should know this. You've heard of Google? Anybody not heard of Google? You know, a big company, yeah. So they got more money they got, and they did this really cool study on what makes teams work. Because as a big company, they want to work effectively, and they realize that teams are what's important. And they did, they hired, and it's like Google, so they hired like a dozen scientists and did you know, a, a really wide study on a lot of their teams. It's good science, and there's also many good articles in it, so it's really worth knowing uh, what they came up with. There is this management 3.0 network. It's very cool, has many tools and many techniques and, and workshops and probably kind of things you were doing with your team for culture building. It's a whole toolbox of ideas. This idea of learning organizations, DDO, Deliverably Developmental Organizations. It's a long thing. It's a really great book with lots of really great case studies. Reinventing Organizations. Has anybody heard of the Reinventing Organizations book? One. Not many. Agile, less Agile at Scale, and Sociocracy 3.0. And just briefly, if anybody's, because I kind of talk generally maybe hopefully inspired you about the motivation of why this kind of stuff might be interesting. Sociocracy 3.0 is a concrete framework for making self-designing teams and organizations, and there is a meetup about it tomorrow. So I'm going, I think it should be pretty cool. Uh, yeah, I mean, there is, there is multiple frameworks, and I think the key idea is if you're like, oh yeah, I want to have a non-hierarchical organization, don't try and invent it yourself. It's a lot of work, and you're more likely to fail than to succeed. Start with some framework like this, and all of these frameworks are self, you know, double loop learning, so you keep on improving it. So it doesn't mean like you adopt the framework and you stuck with it for life. The framework is designed so you keep on changing your system and it will adapt to you, but you're much better off to start something that's known to work well and do that as a starting point and try and invent things yourself. Because there are subtleties to these things. Uh, so yeah, so these are kind of the questions I would want to, to you to leave with. Would you want to work in a distributed team? Who would want to work in a distributed team? Maybe. A few. OK, not too bad. Who would like to improve the teamwork UX where they are? <laughs> not bad. So that's me. I love to talk about distributed teams and improving teamwork UX. OK, pretty cool. Thank you. This guy's turn. Yes, 
Uh, So, last talk. Um, it's going to be by John Barnes. This gentleman here and here. His hair is longer. Um, and um, I met John because he wrote a book called Democracy Squared, which I bought, by the way, Thanks. a long time ago. And um, Thanks, man. it was about reinventing democracy. Why the subject, right? And... Um, he has been uh, working on that and studying that, and also is, I think, a designer at heart. Ooh. 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 Damn. Smart offices automation that at 8 o'clock yeah. turn off the lights and everybody goes away. Sorry about that. <laughs> we, got, we got hacked. <laughs> yeah, there it is. Yay. Both of you. <laughs> uh, so, uh, John here. Um, <laughs> You should follow his um, website, newsletter, and podcast, especially the podcast, which is really cool. It's called the Our My Three Podcast, which I think it's a, a good designer podcast. It's, I mean, designers should, designers should listen to it. It's a How My Three <coughs> Podcast. So um, he has uh, thought a lot about organization models, and um, I would say so, and so he's going to be talking about how to find rhythm in chaos. He has no slides. And so, we're just going to listen to him speak. Hello. Um, maybe just one bit of vernacular from the previous session. I'm going to use the word distributed a lot, but I actually mean something slightly different. I'm kind of talking about decentralized in general, not necessarily geographically, although that can be the case. Just in case like there's the same word that means a different thing, that, that's why. Um, I started um, this kind of journey I'm on from the... Oh, by the way, Paolo, what time do I have to finish? Just so I know how long I've got to talk. Because I could go forever. Half an hour. Yeah, great. I'll, I'll stop in half an hour, I promise. Um, I, I started uh, with culture as, as the thing I cared about most, really. So, you know, like a lot of people, I think I started in organisations that were just horrible to be in and, and were just like radical dictatorships. Uh, and that, that really annoyed me. So, so I kind of made it my life mission to help as many organizations as I could to move like, towards participation. So in the case of massive organizations, it's like a tiny change in the dial. Case of smaller teams, it can be just insanely transformative, like the, like the examples you've, you've heard before, I think, are, are really powerful examples. And that's kind of where I started. Then I also had a huge interest in technology. And the more I merged them together, I was just wondering how countries were run. And I didn't really come at any definition of democracy that I thought was worthwhile. I've, I, in, my, in my opinion, I've still not seen a democracy uh, for a nation. And I'll talk about that a bit in a, in a minute. Um, but I see loads of hope in those directions. I also see loads of dangers. Um, so what I want to talk to you about today is kind of like zooming up from organizations into countries and then all the way back down into schools as well and individuals. And hopefully we'll have some sort of broad like frame of reference as to what distribution could really mean uh, and what it doesn't really mean at the moment. Um, I'm also coming at it like with a slight split personality. So sometimes I'm going to be speaking in like the language of engineering uh, and talk about distributed systems and those kind of things. Other times it's more the psychologist or the, the hippie in me and I'm, I'm going to talk about feelings, which I think are really important to understand democracy. I think they, they're quite vital things, uh, feelings. So we're, we're going to kind of go, go through that. Um, let me like start at the top. Uh, and essentially what I, the, the premise for this originally for me is that I think the world is, is changing to a really unprecedented point, and we hear this all the time. Um, but, uh, but I think there's maybe one way of cutting to it that I think is, is quite easy. And this is if I ask you to, uh, I'm going to do a little quiz with you, and I think you're all going to have an answer that I can guess already, but we'll, I want you to think instinctively. If I tell you a company makes two million in year one, so this is a new company that we found, year one it makes two million. In year two it makes four million. How much is it going to make in year three? Two, four, how much does it make in year three? Eight. Eight, okay. And some people thought six? Yeah. yeah. You're right, okay. Any other answers? Sixteen. Right, two, four, uh, two, four, six, eight, or sixteen. 
Those are the answers every time, and they make sense, right? Because 2 plus 2, 4, plus 2, 6. If you do times, then you get 8. Times itself, you get 16. And there's one answer. I've done this like with maybe 1,000 people. And there's another answer that no one ever says. And that's if 2 to the power of 2 is 4, and 4 to the power of 4 is 256. So there's this last answer. If you think of it like curves, you've got linear, a bit exponential, a bit, and then that one. And what we have is that historically, it goes 2, 4, 2, 5, 6. Look at like the adoption of most technologies or of global warming for that matter, or population growth, it, growth, it goes 2, 4, 2, 5, 6. But we, are, uh, we have a bias in the brain that makes us think things go linear. I'm assuming it's evolutionary, that when you were a caveman, like life was kind of like yesterday, and until there's a breakthrough like fire, and then like, like life changes and you can have like cooked meat and stuff. But, but that gap in between, <coughs> Between the 6 and the 256, that's why things feel really different today. And I think it's why a lot of us have a real sense of uncertainty or fear. It's why a lot of organizations want to transform all the time, because the world's going 256, and they're going 6. And it's like, this is really slow. We're not, we're not coping with the pace of change. So if I take that as like the, a basic, a really simple way of explaining complexity, you could do it in other ways. like. Talk about the fact there are more smartphones talking to each other in the world than there are people. And these are all automated things. You have like scientifically described chaos. It's, it's not just like an adjective to say, oh, it's chaotic. It's scientifically chaotic. But the systems that we use to govern us, they go two, four, six. If I, if I just ask you to imagine, sometimes I show a picture of the House of, Co of Commons in England, the Parliament. If I put it in grayscale, you wouldn't know if it was this year or decades ago. Um, the only reason you know it's recent is because it was taken on a camera. But it, before cameras, it was still the same. It was still like opposition parties with a central government. You vote, you vote every five years for a party who votes for a person that you don't know. They make all the decisions for the next five years. So what that means is you basically have tiny bandwidth. You have these crazy complex problems with tiny bandwidth, so not much you can't make decisions very fast in that system. You certainly can't make very intelligent decisions because you've got such a small p number of people making such complex decisions for so many people. So, so complexity kind of breaks, breaks down. We have this like, problem with where the, the way we govern our countries doesn't, just doesn't really make sense. And so there are models now, this is me taking from the, the, the highest level possible. If you think at the level of a country, if you were to design democracy post-internet, you would design it really differently. You wouldn't go to a ballot box every five years and tick a box and not even show your ID. And that's like, you're done for the next five years. You'd have a really different model. And so we're seeing some emerge. Um, there's one intellectual concept that I think is quite interesting, but it's not worked in practice yet, called liquid democracy. And this is the idea. This is, just think of that as a metaphor. I think that the term is enough, but it's a system that's always changing. And I think we can scale some of the systems that we've heard spoken about before to countries. So I worked with a startup in Australia called MyVote, and they're using the blockchain to have a form of direct democracy um, that can scale at pretty much any level, really. Uh, where citizens have to be informed in order to take part, and it happens on a monthly basis. So even monthly would be like quite a lot better <coughs> than every five years. As a model for like how good a citizen you are, if you tick to like blue or red every five years, is kind of a pretty low threshold on whether you've, you've participated or not. So I think we're going to see a huge shift in that way. There's another one called VTaiwan, which I, I recommend you look into. In Taiwan, they've used AI to really crowdsource consensus and opinion amongst huge numbers of people. And then they've changed laws in like a matter of months because of that. So I think we, we, have, we have the possibility to redesign distributed systems at a really high level. And then I'll take you down one, one narrower. And that's that we like to talk about the concept of democracy as we all live in a democracy. That, that would be something that most people would, would agree to. We, I live in a democracy, yes or no. Most people would say yes. I'm really questioning that. I don't think that's true. I don't think deciding every five years is, is a, I think that's a really shit definition of democracy. Um, but most of our daytime is spent at work anyway. So whether you live in a democracy in terms of your government or not, most of the time you're at work. 
And most workplaces are just like, look nothing like a democracy. I mean, most of them really are like tyrannical hierarchies. You know, they, they in no way resemble any sort of participation, which is why the movements that I think have been discussed today are perhaps more vital than countries in a way, because everyone's at work all day anyway. So having some sort of say over when you go to work, when you don't go to work, how your team organizes, this is really, really important stuff. I think that would impact a huge, huge number of people. And I think there's two ways of looking at that problem. This is where I get a bit bipolar. You've got the, you've got the kind of engineering side of it. And you can look at models like sociocracy, holacracy, um, scaling agile, which Spotify have like made, made famous as examples. And these are, these are systems, right? They're drawn and written, uh, uh, and, and, and they, they're always borrowed from engineering culture. So they were all, in fact, they were all invented by someone who understood even, either machine or software engineering, sociocracy, holacracy, agile, all of them. Um, and the reason is because the pe people with that type of mindset tend to understand complex systems very well, very intellectually, and they understand the maths behind it. And they understand that a system has to have feedback in order to self-improve. But there's, there's one part of it that's often missing in that world, and that's the psychological aspect. So if it's, it's fine to look at a complex system, but it's not machines, it's people. And we're all like, you know, we're all messed up to some degree. Like we all have some sort of trauma from childhood or some like inability to decide what I decide at any given moment to the degree where I don't know the next sentence I'm going to say. That's, that's true. And you don't know what you're about to think. That's also true. Like if I ask you to guess your next thought, you can't do that, right? It's impossible. If I ask you to pick a film, you just picked a film and you have no idea why you picked that film. I just thought of Harry Potter. I didn't choose to think of Harry Potter. I just thought of Harry Potter. I can guess why I thought of Harry Potter. I think there's an eight-year-old boy who has something to do with that. But, but the, the psychological element of working together is also really important. And I see a lot of work in companies where you have the engineering side, which I think has provided loads, particularly in the last 10 years, let's say, in terms of how to scale group participation. And then I see psychologists, which are typically coaches, facilitators, who are amazing at getting groups of people to work together better. Um, but the two like, often don't speak. So you, you often have like, a real engineering culture or like, a, a real facilitative, often quite caring culture. And I think really understanding both is, is really vital. I'm, I'm stereotyping. And there are lots of organizations, I'm sure, that do understand the value of both. I think we just heard some before. Um, but in general, I think that's, that's what I'm seeing. And so I think this shift towards increased participation at work is, just checking, is really vital. I think I'll probably be shorter than needed. Um, is really, really vital. But there's, um, I had an experience recently that really put into context why it's so difficult. Um, and oh, and I'll, t I'll tell the story, actually. Maybe it's an easiest way to do it. So I have a little boy who's eight. And uh, last year, we went to Costa Rica because we wanted him to go to this crazy democratic school we'd seen in the jungle. So think of a school run by children. Um, and most people are like, well, that's chaos. What I'm saying is that the world's scientifically chaotic. So it should be chaos. Otherwise, it's not the real world. I think like timetables and, and like the way you're sat in a classroom, that's just artificial control. You then go to a world that's chaotic, and you're like, hang on. Normally, like, everything goes according to the bell. And here it's really different. So he went to this school, and you basically do what you want, right? I mean, it's more or less like that. I'll explain some. There's more to it than that, but, but it's kind of like that, at least to a kid. And he goes on his first day, and he, the first thing that happens is they're really caring and invite him in. And then they say, you're going to have a great time. Uh, there's some lockers. Just put your backpack in the locker. And he, there's loads of lockers, and he's just like, like, I don't know where to put my backpack. There's 10 lockers. I don't know which one. So he wants me to help him. And this happened a few times. He did it as well with, um, he saw some kids were barefooted, some were wearing flip-flops, some were wearing shoes. And he's like, should I, I mean, do I take them off? Do I keep them on? What do I do? Right? And he's like a bit paralyzed in this moment. And I was just like, he's, he was seven at the time. He'd been to like directive school, as I now call it, for like a few years, not much. But already, he had this idea that like, there's got to be one way that's right, and the others are wrong. Like, I'm not quite sure how to deal with this. 
Um, so just think of that and then add, I'm assuming most of you are like, I'm going to be safe and say mid-20s to, to 50. Uh, like you've just, you've had so much of that in your lives, right? If I think of the number of times in the day where I'm seeking some sort of control and I've got this idea that I could do that, but what if I get it wrong? We were talking about fear of failure earlier. I mean, of course, if a seven-year-old isn't sure which, which place to put the backpack in, just add years of, of indoctrination and, and you end up with workforces of today. And essentially, they're mirror images of each other, right? You have a teacher, a manager. You have um, subjects. You have departments. Um, you have grades. You have pay grades. I mean, it's like the same thing, but, but like with a, with a suit and tie, fundamentally. In fact, there's uniforms in some schools. There's uniforms in some works. I mean, they're, they're more or less the same thing. And essentially, I think we've just all been taught how to not collaborate. You're like uh, judged as an individual rather than in a group of people. And so it makes it very difficult the moment you're working in a group of people to know how to do that because you're asked to shh, like speak later, don't speak in class. So the, the skill sets that I think predominantly I'm stereotyping because I've got like 20 minutes with you guys. But uh, <laughs> there's obviously lots of nuance to this. But they just, they just don't mirror the kind of workplace we want. So then when we talk about workplaces that are more self-managed, uh, well, like, you know, if you don't know where to put your backpack, 20 years later of non-self-management training, and you, you, you will still have the same problem. Uh, and this is why we struggle, I think, with some of this self-discipline. Like knowing, like, you know, are you, are you at, most people, I would say, are pretty bad at knowing, like, how to spend their time at work. For instance, the, the best one I did is recently I asked people uh, in a room how many people check their phone before leaving bed. Let's do a hands up. How many people check their phone before leaving bed? <coughs> and then there's like half of the rest who are like a bit shy to say. But the number's normally quite high. Um, my point is that we're often very bad at self-managing our own routines. Could be around technology or meetings. So the amount of self-discipline that was being asked from you in the previous session, uh, that is absolutely necessary today, but we just weren't educated to do it. So it's really hard to be a self-disciplined human in a chaotic 21st century, and yet it's more important than ever before. So after, I'd say after two weeks, he came back from school, like, really different. First thing is, instead of walking like this, he's like that. And then he's like, John, how was your day? And I'm like, why are you at, what? What happened? Like, they've just sliced him open and like, <laughs> put a new one in or something. And he started suggesting activities, he started taking part in the cooking. We now have a family constitution, which is pretty geeky. We have an A4 piece of paper, and every week we set some rules together. We negotiate, and then those are the rules for the next week. And then like the rules change as we go along. The one that we revisit every single week is technology. He wants more. We show him the, the science. It says, like, not too much, you're eight, so 45 minutes max. Then he says, but you two are always on your phones. Well, that, that's true. If I believe in this, then I have to, which is really annoying, because now autocracy would be my favored model, right? <laughs> I'd benefit so much more. Then, if he's, then what matters is how do you resolve conflict? We, we disagree all the time. I kind of just want to say, well, I'm the adult, so I'm right and you're wrong. Unfortunately, I, I would be a living irony, which I still am, I'd say, 50% of the time. And the rest of the time, I'm just trying my hardest to like, negotiate with an eight-year-old. Um, but it works. Like we, we see increased cooperation over time. Um, now again, I'm stereotyping. It's also really hard. And like, there's a number of moments where I'm like, this is going totally wrong. Um, but just think of these same principles. If you want countries to be run democratically, but then at work you don't decide what you do, because at school you never decided what you do. Of course, you can't, have, can't truly call it a democracy culturally, at least. And then the final bit I come down on my like macro countries, a bit less macro organizations, schools, is the self. And that's really important as well. I think uh, particularly from a young age, we're not trained to understand our own minds. You learn maths and physics and all sorts, and you go into companies and you learn all sorts of other stuff. But very rarely do you notice that you're thinking right now. Like, and this, this is where I... I'm a, a huge advocate of meditation in general, just because knowing what you're thinking right now is a really valuable way of knowing what kind of decisions you make in a group. Like, have you noticed in a group 
that you, there are some group situations where you talk more than everyone else. There are other group situations where you always let someone else talk. Like, do you, do you notice that that's happening? Sometimes these things are like, they're, they're cultural biases. So we slip in and out of them. We don't know that we're, we're being led by the algorithm to some degree. I go surfing a lot with our pal Pedro in the back. And one thing I've noticed is that there's an alpha surfer. There's this one guy, it's always a guy, um, who's either very good or very old, and everyone else just follows them and goes around that surfer. It's a total herding effect. The other one is in Lisbon Airport. When you come to arrivals, you know people can turn left or right. You can guarantee it goes 10, 10. So someone turns right, everyone turns right, until someone comes out knowing full well that their car is on the left. Then everyone turns left. So we're, <laughs> we're just doing this all the time. And I think fundamentally that comes to some sort of lack of self-awareness that we all have, right? I'm, I'm absolutely not absolving myself from these same cognitive biases. I'm sure I'm doing loads of things right now I'm not aware of, and I'm doing it because of, of something in the room. And so understanding this is key to us understanding other people and understanding groups and being a bit more self-aware, fundamentally loving towards each other in, in groups. But you're not allowed to use words like love at work because that's weird. Um, but it's, that's fundamentally really what it's about, having some sort of compassion for yourself and someone else. Um, so now you're really seeing my split personality. These, these two things are just as important as one another. And what I just add to the organizational layer that I forgot to add in is that that itself can be broken down into components. For it to be truly distributed, it needs to go from the organizational structures that we talk about, even the ownership model, because you have a lot of companies that are quote unquote distributed, but they're owned by one group of people. So fundamentally, when it comes down to it, they, they can truly decide legally to stop anything. And you're seeing some sort of movement toward cooperatives where workers also have a share in, in things, or even in France, it's an old model called mutuelles, where the customers might own part of the company. So imagine if Facebook were owned by its users, you probably wouldn't have all sorts of ideological nonsense going on quite as much. It wouldn't have the same effect. Or if Uber were owned by its drivers, you'd have a really different effect, which is something that's, that exists, is happening in, in the US a bit. So you have ownership structures down to groups, down to teams. Like, is your team facilitated or led? So even that can, can be broken down. So fundamentally, I guess, just to, to wrap up my semi-long uh, rant, really, uh, is that like, I find myself utterly dissatisfied with the way we govern our countries, companies, schools, families, selves. Like, I don't govern myself well enough. I, I feel like I missed out on years of training, and I'm just like getting to it now. Um, I find myself incredibly dissatisfied and saddened by that, but I equally see so much opportunity. I see technology, like ideas like the blockchain, really helping to have distributed countries. Um, I see companies like all the movements that were listed before, sociocracy, holacracy, teal, all these models, perhaps platform cooperatives is an important one, really understanding distributed systems. You see schools that are run democratically. I think that's like really awesome. They had like kids council on Mondays where the kids would <coughs> decide together what's not working at school, what am I going to take responsibility for changing this week? And then they vote each other into position. And then down to like mindfulness being something that's, that's just like swept to the world recently as if like we invented it on an app, but it's like 2,500 years old, but we just believe it now. Um, and that's about governing your, yourself. And so I find myself like upset and angry that things aren't distributed and equally full of hope like there's so much cool shit we could we could do uh, and that i i recommend you all do too that's me Thanks. <laughs>